Hi, this is Mark Laughlin speaking for the Ambidextral Gunfighter. A little bit on firearms, arms for Micronova Day. So what is Micronova Day? Well, just a quick overview. There's a, a, there's a hypothesis that there's a 12,000 year catastrophe cycle where, and it includes also in advance of that, some CMEs and solar flares will likely take down technological civilization as we know it. Technology be wiped out, all your electronics, anything, any wires will be smoked. Energy and transportation will be crushed. Agriculture will be interrupted. No food deliveries in the cities, or elsewhere for that matter. Uh, governments will be rendered impotent, or more impotent. And you can figure maybe 10, 20, maybe 30% of the human population will survive the event. And then there's also man-made micronovas, um, more properly known as EMPs, EMP weapons. And I highly suggest you check out Origins of the Fourth World War by Jeffrey Nyquist, or J.R. Nyquist and or check out some of his uh, uh, interviews on videos and check out his blog. I'll have links down in the description. That sounds pretty grim, but humanity has survived this before. Now some people say, well, if there's a micronova, I don't care. I just want to, you know, let it burn me up, take me. Uh, uh, that's fine. I can understand that uh, perspective, but do you really want to remain oblivious to the galactic tidal wave? It's fine for yourself, but can you make that decision for your children and your grandchildren? I can't, so let's get to work. Presumably, if you're here, you're already familiar with eyes open, no fear, suspicious observers. If not, you need to be. And if not, go watch their 12,000 year cycle playlist, link listed in description. Go watch that before you even bother continuing with this video, because it really won't make sense unless you have that context. So check out Suspicious Observers 12,000 year cycle playlist, and some of their other videos as well. I'll include several links down in the description. And then also check out the book, by Ben Davis had called the next end of the world. That phrase actually means, you know, we've made it through the end of the world several times before and we'll do so again. And with advanced knowledge, perhaps you or your family, your children, your grandchildren can be a part of that future. So arms for the Micronova. So let's look at firearms philosophy of use. Firearms and gear for self-defense and firearms to procure food, meat. Now, if the Micronova wipes out, say, 70% of the human population of the Earth, the need to defend yourself against other people probably will be greatly reduced. For one, it's a smaller percentage of the looter population will survive. I mean, people that are usually the looter mentalities, the, uh, you know, aggressors, uh, plunderers, they don't think long range. And so they're unlikely to survive the catastrophe. Uh, as compared to, say, those with foresight and the prepper mentality. Now, in the initial period, there may be some, you know, local rule of law. And so, firearms that are quiet and hard to locate the report, you know, the gunshot, uh, when fired, uh, are beneficial during that, especially during the interim, interim period between rule of law and what some people call without rule of law. Now, Selko, the Bosnian survivalist, warns that there won't be a world without rule of law, but there will be a world with a different rule of law. And that different is probably not the kind of rule of law you're going to be particularly fond of. But anyway, so we want firearms that can be quiet, take small game if you need to, in a local city park, you know, in populated areas, maybe shoot squirrels, and not draw a lot of attention. Or even if you have to, you know, smoke a few looters and plunderers or, or people trying to kill you, um, maybe you don't want to draw attention to that either 
So it might be like here in Wyoming, we know as shoot, shovel, and shut up. So it could be shoot, looters, shovel, and shut up as well. So that brings me to what firearm fits that, that ideal philosophy of use. And I think it's going to be generally the 22 long rifle chambered firearms. A 22 long rifle rifle and a, and a pistol. For example, a uh, Kel-Tec P-17, 22 caliber pistol, fine self-defense weapon. Uh, don't underestimate the effectiveness of a 22. I'll include a link to my video, how the 22 wins, 9 millimeter versus 22. There are a lot of advantages and you'll be surprised to discover some of the statistics in favor of the 22. And then also, I'm very fond of a 22 rifle and specifically an accurate bolt action rifle. Now, one thing is it's easy for everyone to operate. Very simple. Man, woman, or child. The manual action is reliable, and it's reliable with subsonic cartridges, which are, uh, say, 22 cartridges that are running a little bit slower, and so won't have that uh, sonic boom or sonic shock wave, and so they're much quieter coming out the muzzle of your rifle. Now, a, uh, like a Ruger 1022 is a semi-automatic 22 rifle, which is everywhere, and there's an advantage to having a Ruger 1022, one that automatically loads every shot. And also, parts are available for it everywhere. So there's a good case to be made for the Ruger 1022 as your, you know, your micro day rifle. But I really like the Tika T1X. Uh, one, it's, it's very accurate and, and can reliably work fire those uh, subsonic cartridges, lower powered cartridges. Uh, the 22, uh, the 1022 by Ruger will generally fire those cartridges, but it's gonna, you know, the reliability is gonna drop off a little bit because it's just not gonna be enough uh, oomph, enough power to cycle the action reliably especially if it gets a little bit dirty. Now, advantage of the subsonic cartridge, besides being quiet, is that it doesn't uh, suffer the instability when it drops, you know, a, a conventional 22 cartridge, when it drops out of being a sonic, you know, uh, faster than the speed of sound, and when it drops below that level, there's that instability point and it, uh, you know, the accuracy suffers a little bit. Now, a lot of uh, long-range precision marksmen with 22 rifles will use the subsonic rounds because they, they are consistent all the way from, from the muzzle all the way to the target. They're not dropping out of that sonic, uh, the speed of sound. Now, another advantage of the bolt-action rifle is it's just brute simple. Uh, it's just, it's do-it-yourself cottage industry repairable probably for the most part. So there's that advantage of the bolt action rifle as well for you know that uh, micro day, uh, Z day kind of into the world kind of thing. So and then the 22 the, another advantage is that it also is easy to carry. Uh, you could carry in a backpack 500 rounds of 22 and you're not going to better carry uh, you know 500 rounds of a centerfire cartridge like 556 or 308 is going to be quite a loadout so much lighter weight as soon as you get your 22 rifle whether it's the tika t1x ruger 1022 take it and go tend a project appleseed rifle marksmanship clinic that should be one of your first things to do get a 22 rifle and go tend attend a project appleseed rifle marksmanship clinic now uh, and at the clinic you'll learn to shoot from field positions and you'll learn the techniques of marksmanship from natural point of aim, six steps to firing the shot, and all the steady hold factors for different shooting positions whether they're standing offhand, seated, or prone. And uh, there's a couple of stages in earning your rifleman patch where you'll be doing magazine changes. And there's a little bit of a time limit on those and so being fairly quick is an advantage. Uh, or is a require some effort. 
The Ruger 1022 will give you the advantage of being semi-auto, so you're able to maintain your natural point of aim through, throughout your uh, each stage of the Project Appleseed AQT, Army Qualification Test, or Appleseed Qualification Test. Or and and then also it's really quick for mag changes. Now the Tico T1X is also very good for mag changes, but you do have to operate that boat, so it's kind of disturbing your sight picture between shots. Now in my testing, I was surprised. I thought, you know, maybe I could score almost as well with a, a bolt action gun as I do my Ruger 1022, and my Ruger 1022 is set up to be really almost a dedicated Project Appleseed rifle, and so when I did a test, and I'll include a link down in the description of where I did a shootout between my Tico T1X and my Ruger 1022. And every stage I did better with the T1X. And that's surprising because that was with a rifle that was relatively new to me compared to my Ruger 1022, which is, I have years of experience operating and running. So that's just one reason I like the Tico T1X. Now another thing about attending a Project Appleseed Rifle Marksmanship Clinic is that you will not only learn how to shoot and shoot well, but you'll establish connections with other people, other people that are capable of long range thinking. So get signed up and then go watch my Appleseed Prep video series, link down in the description. Appleseed Prep video series will help you prepare in advance of attending a Project Appleseed Rifle Marksmanship Clinic and help you get the most out of the instruction. So anyway, for 22 rifles, I have reviews on the Tika T1X, so links down in the description, as well as the Ruger 1022, links down in the description. Now, for the accurate and lightweight 22 caliber pistol. Now lightweight means it's easy to carry and fairly compact. This uh, pistol without the sight on it, this optical sight, weighs about just a, almost 12.8 ounces I think, 13 ounces, so it's extremely lightweight and its capacity it's, it holds 16 rounds in its magazine. So it's easy to carry with you while you're doing chores, you know you can fight your way back to your rifle and uh, also take advantage of uh, meat of opportunity as you're out doing work in the field. So anyway, you think of this as being a 22 as being inadequate for personal self-defense. So again, check out my videos, my video, how the 22 wins, nine millimeter versus 22. Link in the description. Now, uh, besides the kel P17, there's a Taurus TX-22, I have no experience with that. And also, I would check out the uh, several of the Browning pistols, the Buckmarks. Those are excellent hunting pistols, they, uh, especially if you want to run iron sights. You can get those with a five and a half inch barrels or even seven inch barrels. And that gives you a longer sight radius, radius and a little bit more muzzle velocity, but mainly it's that sight radius that makes them so accurate. And the uh, Browning buck marks are they're heavier. They're not something that's really as comfortable and convenient to carry in the field as the P17. Uh, they weigh three times as much. But as far as hitting small game, they're gonna they're an excellent choice. And um, they're going to be a little more durable than, uh, you know, these plastic lightweight pistols. But nonetheless, you could buy, you know, you could buy two P17s for the price of one Browning Buckmark. So uh, it's, you know, one or the other. You could buy, you know, two and have spares of the P17s or one Browning. So it's, uh, it's a tough choice to make. It's something you just have to figure out for yourself. But uh, also there's... Uh, one other thing I do like about the <clears throat> P17, it's one of the few, besides the Walther P22Q, it has a paddle magazine release. Now you wonder why, why do I think that's such a benefit for Micronova Day? Well, one thing is if you're going to be carrying this pistol out in the field every day doing chores, a button magazine release where a conventional pistol has a button that you put on the side that you push, if you bump into stuff, you, you know, rolling around doing work on the ground, uh, you know, it, it's easy to accidentally bump that button and then caught, end up with a accidentally disengaged magazine or even lose the magazine. I actually lost a magazine off my Hellcat once for the, from that. 
Yeah, whereas the paddle magazine release, when it's in the holster, it's very well protected. And no matter how hard you hit the side of the pistol, you're not going to end up with an accidentally disengaged magazine. So I highly recommend the paddle magazine release on your, your self-defense pistol. So anyway, check out my review in the uh, link in the description of the kel P17. I have a whole series of videos on that pistol, including how to mount the... How to mount one of these uh, red dot optics on it and i have a forthcoming review of uh, a browning buckmark pistol as well so watch for that that'll be included and in, added to the arms for the micronova playlist now let's move to what most people think of for end of the world type firearms the center fire cartridges and again i want to emphasize 22 should be your first first thing to work on securing rifle and pistol now the center fire cartridges uh, one of the things is the what i call the backpack or scout or concealed carry carbine and that uh, one of my favorites in that uh, with that philosophy of use would be the keltec SU-16C, which is a folding rifle, very lightweight, fits in your backpack, and uh, and it fires a 223 or 556 cartridge. So it's a center fire cartridge, same cartridge as like an AR-15. So it has some good velocity, pretty decent reach, and is very lightweight and portable. Uh, that Caltech SU-16 folds into a 24 inch, just a little over 24 inches, maybe 25 inches long, and it, it's so lightweight it feels like a toy. I have a whole video series on backpack carbines, SU-16, I'll include a link down in the description. Now other center fire 9mm pistols, are they necessary? I do like the SIG P365 series, the Hellcats, the Mossberg MC2Cs for the 9mm pistols, but honestly, uh, while I have you know have all of those for my daily carry, I'm pretty much Caltech P17 for that, a 22 caliber pistol. Now while the SU16C is a great portable backpack rifle, it's not what I would consider a fighting rifle or a battle rifle or a fighting carbine. Uh, that I actually think of as the RDB, Caltech RDB bullpup rifle or uh, an, an AR-15. Probably my favorite good solid well-built AR-15 would be the BCM. I really like the BCM Recce. I have links uh, to the description of my reviews of that, as well as a link to the video series on the Caltech RDB down in the description. Now the RDB being a bullpup is excellent for gunfighting when the targets are shooting back and if you are an ambidextrous shooter. Now why be why do I advocate being ambidextrous for gunfighting? One is for optimal use of cover. First rule of gunfighting is if somebody else is gunfighting you and shooting back is you don't want to get shot. That's the first rule of gunfighting is don't get shot. And then worry about shooting the other guy. There's a couple of things between the RDB and the AR. Now the RDB I prefer for gunfighting. It's just, uh, I come from paintball, uh, tournament paintball where we're gunfighting and we, that's where we learn to become ambidextrous, the importance of being ambidextrous. And so I prefer the RDB for that. But there's also a case to be made for the AR-15 because parts are everywhere for that. You can practically find parts in your local, you know, convenience store for AR-15s. So, uh, and also an AR-15, especially like a BCM, Bravo Company Manufacturing, is going to be more reliable than an RDB. RDB, I do, I have had or had a broken firing pin with that. So you, if you get an RDB. For the optimal gunfighting aspects of it, you know, make sure you have parts for it, extra firing pins and other, you know, pieces for it as well, and take care to maintain it well. AR-15 is going to be able to handle being abused a little bit more, and it's going to be more reliable long term, and your parts are going to be available. So, so I'm I'm torn between the RDB and the AR-15. Now the the 556. You know, these 5.56 rifles do extend your range, you know, out to say 500 yards and a little bit beyond as compared to, let's say, a 22 long rifle, which is, you'd be pushing it to uh, make hits out to 300 yards with that. But the 22 has the advantage of being a lot, lot quieter and a lot harder to, for someone to detect where that gunshot came from. 
Now what about larger calibers like uh, 762 or 50 BMG? You know, like a sniper rifle kind of stuff. You know, if you live in elk country, um, maybe, uh, although we're actually in elk country, uh, <laughs> you can, elk doesn't require that great of a distance shot, they're not usually a long range shot. Um, generally you'll find them, you can get stock within pretty close range of them. A sniper rifle takes pretty specialized skills to really take advantage of a sniper rifle. For most people, the time and money is better spent in other areas especially when we're thinking from an arms for Micronova day that perspective. Mossberg makes the excellent MVP Scout series, which I have reviews, links in the description, which could be candidates for that. And also Desert Tech makes their MDR series, which is a bull, bull pup rifle. Again, a good gunfighting rifle. And uh, I think their 7.62 version is uh, really good. But um, 5.56, I think they're a little bit too heavy for, for the for that caliber, but uh, 762 MDR with links down in the description might be worth checking out. Now, I want to emphasize that caliber, you know, is don't get all hung up on that. I would rather have a rifle team with backwoods and nighttime poaching experience paired with a 22 long rifle than I would the typical keyboard warrior tactical sniper. I'd rather have an ambidextrous optimal use of cover 22 caliber rifle team that is experienced with anticipating the movements of targets that are shooting back than I would a stopwatch obsessed bullseye or run and gun 556 762 non ambi rifle team. There are huge differences between shooting at the range and gunfighting when the targets are shooting back two video series that will lay the groundwork for what makes a good pistol and rifle. I'll include links down in the description. Uh, one is my Rex Applegate video series which will teach you point shooting with the pistol. The other is how to become an ambidextral gunfighter which will teach you and train you to use one both eyes for your side each eye for your sighting system keep both eyes open for situational awareness and let the brain combine the images from both eyes and focus on the target and optimal use of cover. Um, so once you develop these skills, your, your perspective on what makes a good rifle and a good pistol will definitely be altered. So I highly recommend you explore that before you get too heavily involved in, oh, I need this sniper rifle, I need this battle rifle, I need all this other stuff. <clears throat> For reliable optics, for a backpack carbine, I think the tech sights, which are iron sights, are excellent. Also, the Weaver V3, which is discontinued, sadly, but you can find them used on eBay, which is a low, uh, very low-powered variable optic from one to three power. Now, why would you want one power? Again, that's for the quick snap shooting, both eyes open, uh, situational awareness kind of thing. A very, very fast target acquisition with the both eyes open that way. And but yet, you can dial in that three power for some pretty good distance shots. We also, uh, for our fighting rifles, um, very, very fond of the Trigicon ACOG, which is a four power optic and uh, has a, a illuminated reticle and a bullet drop compensator reticle as well. So you can, it's very, very uh, robust and rugged and uses tritium uh, radiation to light up the optic uh, so you don't, you're not dependent upon batteries and just brutally rugged. Um, Highly recommend those, but again, don't get too tied up with all this tactical stuff. Now, tech sites, the iron sites I spoke of, uh, I have a review of those both on our Caltech SU-16 as well as on the AK-47. Now, the tech sites on the AK-47 made an astonishing improvement with that rifle um, and went with from where my son uh, had the ability now to score rifleman score with his AK-47, which he was always just not quite able to do with the stock conventional short sight radius iron sights. So the tech sights extended the sight radius quite a bit and uh, greatly improved the accuracy of that rifle. So there's some possibilities for uh, you know an AK-47 as a 
as a battle rifle but be very careful there's a lot of junk ak-47s out there uh, so you want to look at you know good quality ones uh, like arsenal and there's some other ones as well uh, david Locke also makes a, a really really awesome slr which is basically very similar to ak-47 now the weaver v3 uh, is a, a, a very low powered optic which i'm very fond of i have one on several of my rifles and uh, most people think that you need these massive, big, giant optics and, you know, huge magnification to reach out and touch targets. But optics will not fix marksmanship skills. I don't care how good your magnification is, how well you can see that target, how much you can actually focus in on the, you know, see the buttons you know, on your, you know, on the target you're trying to shoot, see the little buttons or whatever. If your marksmanship fundamentals are poor and you're dragging wood, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's why you need to go to attend a Project Appleseed Rifle Marksmanship Clinic. If you're dragging wood, you don't have natural point of aim. Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go attend one of those clinics. And um, so having that magnification is going to be no good if when you pull the trigger, you're pulling the rifle off six minutes of angle. Kind of useless to have that magnification. So you can't buy accuracy with mag you can't buy accuracy and you can't get it with magnification either now what about archery uh, that's something i'm not really familiar with my son is really big into uh, archery a bit with the he has a nice really nice compound bow so maybe we'll do some videos in the future on that but i think you know archery of course uh, is a very uh, sustainable uh, tool for hunting and self-defense so um, you know i think it's something we definitely need to add to our our uh our preparations for micronova day our arms for micronova day also i do have a recurve bow which is a very old school very simple bow um and i'm fortunate if i can hit like a you know target this big from say 30 yards so not very useful yet for me but uh, with the compound bow i can hit pretty small targets and my son is just stacking those arrows right next to each other with his uh, compound bow so there's a lot of potential there now one thing we want to look at is the marginal utility and opportunity cost of uh, our expenditure and time and training we spend on arms it's easy to get obsessed with the tactical world of firearms and squirreling away a stash of guns and ammo you know spending all our money on guns and ammo but no matter who you are you have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of dollars to prepare for Micronova Day. Now guns and ammo and training all should be part of that equation, but don't get fixated on guns, firearms, and ammo because they are just cool. They're fun to handle, fun to you know admire the worksmanship of them and all that, but there's a lot of other things we need to work on as well. So let's look at some of these tools that are still close to that tactical world that would make you know whatever farms you choose more useful and more available start off with is a means to carry your firearms you know your your kit for carrying uh, now for holsters i like the on my piece i had to make my own holster for my p17 because uh, there isn't a lot of companies yet making inside the waistband holsters. Now for Micro Nova Day, maybe you're not worried about concealment anymore. So you could get uh, for your P17, you could get a uh, Forge Tech holster for that for outside the waistband carry. Now for all my other pistols like my Sig P365, my um, Hellcats and Mossberg MC2C, I use the Desante Slim Tuck inside the waistband holster, which I really like. Very, very thin, very compact, and just don't take up a lot of space inside your waistband. So I like those. Now for everyday carry, I do like the, uh, uh, for in the woods carry, I like the Hill People Runner's Kit Bag, which is the chest mounted bag, and it has a, a holster compartment in it, a concealed carry compartment in it, as well as storage for other like first aid and survival items on it as well. I really like that for mountain biking. Uh, also, the uh, Wyoming Trader CCW Vest, which is for like uh, you know spring and and fall weather 
can still carry a vest that you can uh, carry a pistol inside of and then uh, for carrying rifles I like the Eberly stock mini me backpack with the scabbard rifle scabbard and also um, I'm looking at testing I'm testing some backpacks from chrome as well chrome industries for uh, carrying my my uh, backpack carbine so links to a lot of this stuff will be in the description and let's move on to something else so let's now let's move away from this tactical world on things these because we don't want to get we want to pay attention to opportunity costs and marginal utility what's you know you've got say okay you get your first AR great or if you get your first 22 rifle great do oh I'm gonna get a second 22 rifle now I got my Tika T1X and my Ruger 1022 oh maybe I want one of those Tipman M422s as well so I'll get one of those oh and I got an AR-15 and I got my RDB maybe I should get an RFB for 308 and a Desert Tech MDR oh man you, you, you end up with a, this big pile of weaponry and uh, you don't spend enough time with any of them to become really proficient with any of them um, so you know there's opportunity cost and marginal utility to focus on here the marginal utility of each additional firearm marginal utility of each additionally stored at cartridge of ammo cartridge or ammunition for those firearms so while I might grant you a leeway on purchasing a lot of ammo let's kind of quell that desire for getting too many firearms uh, maybe some parts for them but get some good quality firearms and firearms you're comfortable with I mean we'll carry a lot and lots of ammo for them now what are the opportunity cost if we buy too many firearms okay some other things we need for micro nova day that what I call earth tools shovels pickaxes saws a bow saw crosscut saws you know you need things that are lightweight versus indestructible so i i, I have a, a shovel that's a fisker's shovel that's steel handle looks like it'd be very very durable might last me a long period of time uh, post micro nova day why why do i talk about such boring things like shovels pickaxe pickaxes axes saws and crosscut saws and all this because in micro nova day one of the key things is getting yourself building yourself protection against um, you know cosmic rays x-rays all that energy coming from the sun and shovels are going to be key tools for preserving your life during micro nova day another thing is uh, consider EMP protection for your, your vehicles or at least your key vehicles uh, and get the EMP shield and so it may preserve your modern vehicle and a vehicle that may a vehicle may be of immense use in establishing some distance between you and the unprepared so if, if you have a running vehicle after micro nova day or after the EMP day the ability to get yourself some distance from the unprepared I think is is hugely ad advantageous now will it actually work will it actually protect your vehicle that really depends on how strong that impulse is now what are the other opportunity costs of folk getting too much guns and ammo now I don't want to dissuade you from the guns and ammo but just keep in mind that there are other things to get besides gun and ammo and that's the medical things get your individual individual first aid kit squared away the kit that you carry on your belt you know you want your gauze packs quick clots chest seals tourniquets and all that you want also your camp medical more heavier you know, field pack that's uh, a more detailed pack that you would have with your at your either at your bug out location or in your home if your home is your bug in location so you're gonna have sutures a sam splint uh, saline solution antibiotics uh, I highly recommend the book the ultimate survival medicine guide link down in the description uh, highly recommend that so you can squirrel away and secure your long-term medical needs another opportunity cost foraging books and this is not just the books but also you need to to read these books in advance because it takes time to learn foraging um, this is something really kind of new to me and I'm working on it and hopefully can develop the skills before micro nova day hits or EMP day hits or whatever but this is again money for the books you need to you know instead of spending on firearms and also study learning this foraging stuff uh, you don't want to be eating poisonous plants after micro nova day because you're probably not going to have easy access to medical care so i highly recommend uh, 
A Forager's Harvest, Guide to Identifying, Harvesting, and Preparing Edible Wild Plants, link down in the description. Nature's Garden, and also Incredible Wild Edibles. Uh, all three are terrific books on getting started with foraging. Heating, uh, that's something, again, another expense. In fact, uh, this will equal easily equal the cost of an AR-15 or maybe even uh, uh, more expensive rifles. Uh, I think you should consider looking at getting a, a small, at least a portable or micro, you know, wood stove. Uh, something like the uh, Cubic Grizzly wood stove, uh, include a link down in the description. Something you can set up either with your, your bug out kit or at your bug out location uh, or even just to heat a room in your bug in location. Now something else you'll want to think of for your opportunity cost is uh, it's kind of a medical side of it, things is how I think of it is laundry uh, because in uh, you know the type of scenario we're talking about uh, without good medical care you know little simple little cuts can become uh, life-threatening and so keeping your clothing clean keeping yourself clean like we do today uh, helps prevent uh, simple little cuts becoming uh, bad infections threat life-threatening infections so laundry is going to be a uh, something you got to figure out how to deal with now part of that will be uh, dealing maybe with a big uh, water basin tub to manually wash your wash your clothes there's also a device that's like a, a barrel that has a crank handle on it and uh, which you know washes clothes with a very small amount of water uh, the other thing is if you're gonna have to pack your clothes say a couple of miles you know by walking not by driving your car to the laundromat but if you're going to pack your clothes you're going to want a good a good backpack to carry those clothes down to the nearby creek to uh, you know beat them against the rocks kind of thing so why do i mention all these tools these you know emp tech protection medical foraging and uh, heating these are the opportunity cost of focusing too heavily on the cool stuff the tactical cool stuff you know the firearms and getting lured in by this tactical cool stuff you get you just you can go down this rabbit hole of just getting obsessed with guns and firearms and now if you don't yet currently have these guns and firearms the, the basic like I say 22 long rifle uh, firearms like the a rifle and pistol number one you should definitely have those secured then think about maybe a, a either a backpack carbine or an AR-15 maybe a few of the cup one for each family member if you can do that but if nothing else don't discount the 22 long rifle one you can afford they're affordable and they're affordable to feed and they're capable of feeding you now something keep in mind with 22 long rifle is a lot of people think oh well, i need i need you know a centerfire rifle 556 or 762 to go out and shoot deer no you don't poachers have used 22 rifles to take deer very quietly and with not drawing a lot of attention for years decades uh, i know lots of guys who have gone out at nighttime and taken deer poached deer with a 22 long rifle so again that ability you know a 22 is deadly out you know well beyond 300 yards and its trajectory you can actually work with it out to about 300 yards for, for more normal, normal people and there's there's people that can do it well beyond that but it's capable uh, has the enough energy to do the job now a lot of people think oh I need more hitting power you know kinetic energy well once you've hit a vital organ whether it's the head you know or heart spine central nervous system whatever once you hit that say with a 22 a 22 is going to do is going to destroy it as effectively as a centerfire cartridge all the centerfire cartridges is going to destroy it and then plus go out beyond and put some more energy beyond your initial target so more energy doesn't make them more deader it just gives you maybe a little more reach uh, only for human targets it only takes about 40 foot pounds of energy to kill a human and uh, 
centerfires are well beyond that. 22 caliber is twice that out of out of most most uh, firearms. So anyway, again, I highly recommend before you go rushing out and buying a lot of guns to prepare for Micronova Day, check out the video. Start off with how the 22 wins, 9 millimeter versus 22, and then work from there. Let's get that squared away. Let's get prepared. It's Mark Laughlin speaking for the Ambidextral Gunfighter. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.